it's more and more uh, people interested in our events. Um, we uh, constantly get people asking, or oh, if we can't uh, join it uh, live, is it possible to uh, have recording? That's why uh, the sessions are recorded, uh, just to let you know. Um, we got uh, some new faces, a lot of familiar faces, and hopefully more people will join. Today, we are welcoming back Anne, uh, who did a fantastic session last month about Women of the Grand Tour. She was extremely knowledgeable in presenting the gentle woman uh, from previous historical times who traveled and why they traveled. Today, she's going back to her main business, uh, antique lace trading. And can you tell us, um, you've been doing antique lace and the textile almost for 22 years. How did you get into it? Um, well, I got into textiles by accident because I started antique dealing and I didn't know a lot about it. And I got offered a stall at Portobello Road very early on when I really didn't know very much. And so it was quite a steep le learning curve. And I used to go every week, sell things, all the wrong prices, and all the experienced dealers used to jump on me because I was making mistakes, but I learned a lot. And I gradually found that suddenly my store was full of lace. And what had happened is I just kept buying more and more textiles because I discovered I liked them. So as soon as I did that, I suddenly realized I was a textile dealer. <laughs> and my love for it just grew from there, really. Yeah. Um you've been doing it in London you also went to Japan yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And I got invited to sell at a department store in Tokyo at an antiques event a few times and then I went independently as well it's really interesting experience <laughs> and uh, uh, this year you actually are taking your expertise to a different level yeah we have our lockdowns you did something very educational <laughs> Yeah, that was another that was another mistake. <laughs> I didn't really intend to do it, but I sort of I don't know how it happened. I just ended up doing a master's degree at uh, London University. So um, uh, and it's in history. But before I went, I said to them, can I write my essays um, on textiles? And they all said, yes, no problem. So you do a general course and then you um, when you write an essay on each module, you factor in your interest really the, the area of it you like so you have to do four different modules and a dissertation and I've done three of the uh, modules so far and they've all been about textiles my next one's going to be about textiles and women of the grand tour was one of those subjects so so it's been really great it's been really interesting because you get all the sort of academic background to the subject that you like anyway. You know, they're not telling you about the textiles, they're telling you about the general history, say, of the Grand Tour. And then you factor in your interest to it. So you can research that little sort of niche aspect to it. So it's been really, really interesting. And it was just coincidence, it was during the lockdown. <laughs> so hearing you uh, doing an, uh, un I assume it's online now, online master degree. It, well, it wasn't to start with, but it is because I've been doing it part time over two years. So it was really lovely to go in person at first. But at the moment, I've got no, I haven't got anything this term, but next term I've got another module, which I assume will still be um, online. Yeah. So I reckon that's one of the best ways to deal with pandemic and lockdown. Yeah, one of the lecturers said to me they were really worried when lockdown happened because they weren't expecting to um, talk online but she said they had a 21% increase in people applying for this academic year so obviously a lot of people thinking that <laughs> so in a way um, the uh, COVID made us um, more uh, interested and more informed if, that's, if nothing else <laughs> that would be a slightly a silver lining for uh, yes yes yeah yeah so uh, that's a little bit about N uh, experience in textile and her 2020 this year and whenever you're ready I am yep. going to share the slides so you can, can start your talk yeah so I'm going to share the slides here can you see it now yeah yeah right there we go okay 
Uh, as I said, uh, please, as Minji said, please feel free to ask questions. There's some little Q&A symbols during the um, thing, which will be a stopping point for some further questions. OK, if you put the next one up, please. OK, so thanks for joining uh, me today and Minji. Yeah. Um, right, that's, that's fine. Uh, so, OK, what is lace? You might think everybody knows what lace is, but I think I'll be showing you that you don't really know. <laughs> As I didn't know. <laughs> it's something completely different. Um, what's the difference between, say, embroidery and lace? The difference is lace doesn't have um, a foundation material. So if you think of embroidering something, you embroider onto a backing material. Lace doesn't have that. Uh, lace is its own material. And that's the difference. The other thing is lace has to have holes in it. If there's no holes in it, it's just embroidery. So. Basically, it's an open work fabric. If you look at the um, picture on the left, uh, you can see how transparent it can actually be. That piece of lace, it's all handmade. Even the mesh background is made by hand. You can hardly even see the work by the naked eye. So it's very, very um, skillful work. OK, next one, please, Minji. Thank you. OK, so when was lace made? Lace has got really, really long history. Uh, they think it goes back to the 1400s. Oh, still on when? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> was quick, but not quite that quick. <laughs> okay, when was it made? It was made from the 1400s, but the trouble is they can't tell when they're in documents, because they used to lace up the clothes, like you lace up shoelaces, you lace up shoes with shoelaces, they used to lace up the clothes. So the word lace was used for a lot, you know, from the 13, 1400s onwards. But we really take the beginning of lace as an independent craft to be, that really took off about the mid 1500s. And in fact, in England, the first mention of what they really think is lace is in the, um, funeral inventory of Henry VIII. He died in 1547, and there's mention of a bone lace purse in, in the inventory of all his goods when he died. This particular piece of lace here is absolutely fantastic. If you're looking at it on a big, no. <laughs> uh, the when one. Oh, you're on the wrong one, Minji. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's it, thank you. <laughs> um, look at the, can you see the little pit? men on horseback and all the ornate uh, animals. There's somebody hunting. It's amazing detail. It's all handmade. And the figures are, you know, tiny little figures. There's cupids and everything. That's French lace from the 18th century. Wow. Yeah, well, uh, late, late 17th, early 18th century. OK, next one, please. Beautiful. Uh, where was lace made? What's really interesting is lace is a purely European craft. If you think of any other needlework, it would be made all over the world generally, you know, uh, embroidery and so on. But lace was a purely European craft. It only really moved beyond Europe in colonial times and with missionaries and so on. And then, uh, as we were saying, in South America, <laughs> India, China, it went to all different countries. Um, if you look at the map on the right, these are the sort of main lace making centers in Europe. And you'll know a lot of them. If you know anything about lace or heard anything about lace, Chantilly lace you'll have heard of. Honiton lace is, is England's most famous lace. Uh, Valenciennes, Mechelen, places like that. Brussels, of course, famous for lace. But when you hear of these laces, they're named after a particular place. But it doesn't mean to say that was the only place they were made, because as soon as a certain technique took off, it would be made in other countries and other areas within their own countries. If you look at the bottom left, is a, this is a contemporary picture of an Indian lady making lace. And I found this the other day. This is a commercial lace making school in India. So it spread with um, uh, English colonialism to India. And the, the small piece of lace you can see is really fascinating. And I want to research it further. It's a piece of lace made in Japan and it's bobbin lace in what's called the Honiton style. So this is a technique, Honiton lace. And it's, but it's made in Japan in about 1880. 
And I happen to know that there was a lace school in Yokohama in Japan in about the 1880s. And this is actually an American museum. And if you look at the piece of lace, what is interesting is it's very skillful, beautiful piece of lace. And it's got the cranes, the Japanese symbols on it. And this is what often happens. When, the, when lace travels to another region, people adapt it to their own uh, styles. And I've got a little piece of lace with elephants in it from India and things like that. So it's really interesting how it, it's adapted. OK, next one, please. OK, the lace makers. Um, you'll see many, many pictures of lace makers. It was a really important uh, um, sort of a thing that was represented throughout uh, European art. As I could have found hundreds of pictures of uh, paintings of lace makers. It's often used to symbolize different things. You know, it's um, there's a child you can see being um, monished by a woman with a, I don't know what she's gonna hit her with something in that top picture uh, because she's not working at her lace. You've got the ideal of gentility, diligence, a very good sort of, um, skillful uh, things, often about gender, about, you know, their view of women. Um, the Victorian one, the woman just below the word makers, she actually, the artist is buried in my local church. <laughs> but this is very typical uh, sort of Victorian vision of lace makers. What's interesting is the bottom right is a famous uh, portrait of a uh, lace maker by Caspar Netscher, and it's in the Wallace Collection in London. And I read that the fact that she's kicked off her shoes and they're lying abandoned on the floor shows that she's a woman of not very good morals. <laughs> <laughs> and what shocked me, what shocked me was when I assembled these other pictures, I noticed two other of the women in these two other pictures have thrown their shoes off. <laughs> so there's a very subtle subtext going on in these pictures, I've noticed. <laughs> So there we are. Look out for that when you're looking at pictures of lace makers. Uh, I was about to say, uh, I finally saw some men doing the lace on the bottom left. Then I realized they were not making lace. They were no, you see, that's what's interesting about that picture, that painting, because they are playing cards and, and drinking probably. And she's being very diligent, making lace, and she's very smartly dressed. So it's a contrast. And yet she's hanging out with the men and she's taking the shoe off. So make that of, make of that what you will. <laughs> you want to use our imagination. Yes. OK, moving on. <laughs> OK, I just wanted to put this in because it's just a nice picture. Uh, these are lace makers in uh, Buckinghamshire in England, probably about 1900s, early 1900s. And often, of course, lace was taught to young girls. Some men made lace, not about probably 10% of the lace makers. It varied between area to area. Um, often, if um, a wife was doing it, it's a cottage industry and the husband was, say, a fisherman, he'd often help with the lace making in the winter when he couldn't go to sea. Um, but this is just a nice picture of an elderly lady teaching the young girls uh, the lace making. And the woman on the right who's smiling, she's um, threading the bobbins, um, ready to, which we'll look at in a minute. Okay, if you move on. I just like that picture. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Uh, so who wore the lace? Um, as uh, we've already been discussing before it started, it's all about status and power. They all say about lace, it was worn uh, by the wealthiest in society and made by the poorest in society. It was a professional skill generally rather than a hobby. It's only in the last, occasionally it was a hobby throughout history, but usually it wasn't. It was a professional skill and uh, it was very, very, very expensive to buy. They didn't pay the lace makers a lot, but it was very, very labor intensive. Um, I've got a piece of lace here, um, if I can find it. Um, I don't know if you can see it, if I hold it up to the camera. Can you see? I can't, oh, you can't, so we, no. We can see. Can you see? Yeah, I can see. So it's a piece of lace with yeah. a black background. Yeah, very, very, very tiny lace. So it takes hundreds of hours to make um, wow. certain pieces of lace. So it's very expensive. The ladies in this thing are wearing very ornate sleeves. They call them engagement. 
uh, layered sleeves of lace. And in fact, I was reading something the other day with some woman in the letter was complaining how awkward it was to wear these sleeves. I suppose they were getting your coffee and everything. <laughs> <laughs> they're, drinking, they're drinking hot chocolate here, actually. But <laughs> it was very tedious wearing them. <laughs> anyway, OK, so it's all about wealth and status. So it's distinguishing yourself from the lower classes by showing that you could um, afford the best of everything. Wow. Uh, and that's what lace was about. It was much more important than people imagine. It's like when you think of expensive jewellery today, it's the equivalent. That was the equivalent. In fact, it was often more expensive than expensive jewellery in those 17th, 18th centuries. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, if you move on. And the other people who wore it were the church, of course, uh, ecclesiastical lace. The church was extremely wealthy, extremely powerful, and they, dis they displayed their wealth and status also by wearing fine lace. There's a wonderful altar cloth on the left. Uh, that's, I think, quite a fairly modern one, but it's beautiful lace making. And of course, um, the uh, ecclesia uh, often altar cloths and then ecclesiastical costume. You can see um, some examples there. Any questions so far? So. This will be our uh, little break for question and answers. I'm um, just reading out the comments from people here. Uh, Tarumi was saying really interesting pictures. And oh. Jingha, who's from the US, actually asked a question. Uh, yeah. Does lace, it, does it mean br bracelet? Bracelet? No, no, yeah. it's, it comes from laqueous, I think, which I think means a noose. So it's basically, a piece of string with a hole in the middle. <laughs> That's the sort of the meaning. Yes. And originally. We got Carlos in the group asking, did women make gold lace as well? Yeah, uh, I haven't talked about that, but although we think of lace, uh, they're really good questions. Um, we think of lace as being white, but a lot of the early lace is silver or gold. And wow. it comes from braiding so if you think of Henry VIII and people like that, if you look at their costumes, it would be covered in sort of braiding, like plaiting and embroidery. And that was the basis of bobbin lace. That's what it came from in a way. Um, and often that would be made by guilds. And, and they had, the king had the king's lace man, who was like the guy who bought the lace for the king. He was a sort of procurer of the lace, the king's lace man, they called it. It's like a lace dealer. Um, so it was often men made it. Um, women made it as well. And in fact, one of the lace men to the crown was a woman at one point. So um, yes, men and women made it. And in fact, it was never a guild. This was, the, this was the difference. A lot of embroidery and everything, the Broderers Guild in England was, didn't allow women in. Once they formed guilds, it was men, not women. So, so, and lace was never a guild. So they so escaped that. For the benefit of audience, not from UK. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It means kind of like ancient trade associations. Yeah, trade associations. Yeah, throughout Europe they had them. Sometimes they had women's guilds. In France they had dressmakers' guilds of women. But generally, it depended. Each area had their own rules. Mm. So, but what tended to happen? It was like what we call a closed shop. The men took over. <laughs> what can I say? So. Mike has a very good question. Uh, I say good, not because only he's my husband, but uh, <laughs> basically he asked, uh, upper class woman in the past did embroidery. Why yeah. did they not do lace making? And because it, yeah, very good question. Because it was too difficult. Some women did do lace making as a hobby. And some women who were skilled embroiderers did make lace because it, especially, we'll talk about the two types of lace next, but. There's needle lace they could make, but generally bobbin lace making is far too difficult. I spoke to somebody who does lace making these days and she said Honiton lace, which we'll look at in a minute. She said, you do two years of evening classes in basic lace making before we even let you do Honiton lace making. So it, it takes too long, it's too difficult to learn. People would do apprenticeship for years to learn, um, but, you know, proper lace making. Wow. Yeah. Oh, fantastic introduction about when and where lace came from. And uh, thanks for all the audience questions. Yeah. Would you like to? Yeah, on? keep going, keep going. 
We have a lot of questions at the end. <laughs> okay, like I said, these are the two, we're gonna look at the, very briefly, we're not look at a lot of technical stuff about lace making because we'd be here to Christmas. But um, the two main <laughs> types are bobbin lace. Uh, somebody said Tracy needle lace, more like woven or it's in, it comes from, yes, we're just gonna talk about that. It's, it, is, it does come from needle lace. We'll look at bobbin lace first. Bobbin lace, you can see uh, the pillow, often called pillow lace. Um, the pillows vary in size and shape. This is just one example. And basically you have a pattern uh, you move the pins, you can see the one with the orange, you can see the pins, the pins are to hold the pattern in place while you're working it. The wooden pieces in these illustrations are the bobbins, they're weights, so they're weighing down the threads. You have lots of different threads and you manipulate it by crossing the threads over. If you want to see how this works, go to YouTube. There's some fantastic videos of people demonstrating bobbin lace making. There's a brilliant one of a lady in Brussels. And it's like touch typing. She's moving so quickly, you can hardly see her hands. She's not looking at it. She's doing it almost by muscle memory. Uh, so this is bobbin lace making, the most famous type of lace making. And there's two different ways they do it. One is called, uh, mm -hmm. if you, if you, yeah, uh, one is called straight lace. So the one with the orange background is straight lace. And what that means is the pattern and the background are all worked in one. Even the um, uh, even as they go around the corner, as you can see in this piece. And then the other type is um, part lace, uh, which is the blue one, which is Honiton or Brussels lace uses technique. And what that is, is they make individual motifs. Um, and then they put them together and they join them. So you can say make a lot of different shapes, different flowers and leaves, and then you make up a pattern afterwards. So that's the two main types. So that's the first type of lace. Uh, if you go to the next screen. And this is one Tracy was talking about, needle lace, another very ancient technique. So this is the only other thing that's called a real lace. And as Tracy pointed out, it comes from embroidery. So you look at the top left picture, and that's a piece of embroidery uh, with, well, it's actually cut work, drawn thread work. So you're drawing out threads and, and fill and pulling them together and making designs. And eventually they were cutting out so many of the threads that somebody had the bright idea and thought, this is ridiculous. We don't need a background material to, to ruin. We'll just start without a background material. So the top middle picture shows a pattern. So this would normally be leather, parchment, something like that, waxed uh, paper, at which could be reused. And you'd put a few stitches across it and tack them into place. And then you'd fill in with others. So if you look at the green one or the other blue one, you can see that they're gradually filling in with different um, um, lines across the pattern, but they're not tacking those to the background. Those are freestanding. And um, what you do is once it's finished and it's got enough structure, you just turn it over and, and remove the tacking stitches and you've got a piece of lace. And the pattern, the bottom right is just showing a lot of the filling stitches. So this is what one of the things that needle lace is famous for. The main um, stitches are done with what they call a buttonhole stitch. And then the fillings like the center of the green flower uh, are all different designs, um, different types of filling stitches. So that's needle lace. Okay, if you go to the next one. Uh, oh yeah, that's just a really nice picture of some uh, ornate needle lace. It can be very strong if it's done very tightly. It's rather beautiful, that. A uh, lot of detail. Um, and then the next one, uh, this is also needle lace, but much more fine. This is late 19th century. This is Brussels, point de gare, point, uh, gauze, like gauze that it's so almost see-through. And it's very, very, very ornate. And in fact, even the background um, mesh on this one is made by hand, which is ugh, just so fine, such fine work. Wow. Very, yeah, very, very beautiful. It's a weakness of it actually, because the pattern is heavier. And then when, when I've sold, I've got some here actually, when I've sold it in the, in the past, uh, you always get damage on those bits. I've got a piece here. Oh, how beautiful. Yes, it's lovely. <laughs> Okay, yeah, Brussels, uh, yeah, Belgian lace, uh, Brussels, point de gare. 
Okay, next one. Okay, so we've talked about the two main types of lace. There's one other type. Uh, it's not one, it's a collection of uh, types, which are mainly 19th century. Uh, not all, there are exceptions, but mainly 19th century onwards were these imitation laces. As machine lace, they started making machine lace um, from the early 1800s onwards. And once that happened, the lace makers gradually during the course of the 19th century went out of business, but they tried to keep in business by making quicker laces. And also you had amateurs starting to make things that looked like lace, the middle classes were making things. And these are all the different techniques. These are just a few of them. There are more techniques. So the top left is um, tape lace. So it's a sort of quicker way using tapes instead of just bobbin lace. The lady's collar is tatting. It's a very popular one. I get a lot of American customers who do tatting, uh, which is made with a little shuttle. Uh, the rose is, um, I don't know. Uh, the rose is uh, filet crochet. It's a type of crochet. Uh, top right is lace knitting. That's like Minji's top, lace knitting. <laughs> very fine lace knitting. Uh, below that is a piece of crochet. Crochet really started in the 19th century with these imitation laces. Uh, the blue one in the middle is just embroidery on um, muslin. And the bottom left is nanduti. This is the one we were talking about before we started. Um, uh, sun lace, sol lace, Tenerife lace, it's got lots of names. And this was the Spanish and Portuguese. This was that sort of um, craft that came from there and spread all over South America. They and Latin America, they still make a lot in Paraguay. And if you go to YouTube, there's some really good videos showing them making this. Um, very interesting. I pointed somebody, a lace dealer, to it the other this week, actually, we were talking about it. So there's a lot of um, lot of different imitation techniques. Okay, uh, next one, please. Okay, we've been looking at lace and we're thinking about costume, but of course, lace was used for many other things, not just costume. Uh, furnishings. I could spend hours talking about it. They used to make ex very, very expensive laces um, and then drape them around washstands <laughs> and, and beds, bed curtains they used to make with it. Cost fortunes, which was the whole point of it. But we've got some examples here. Um, cushions, bed linens would be decorated with it. Curtains, of course. Doilies, uh, bed covers, tablecloths. And the one in the middle bottom is uh, 16th century. They had bed covers like this in the 16th century with panels of embroidery and cut work and then panels of filet lace and, and um, often bobbin lace around the edges. So furnishings were also an important thing. They often made it in the lace in a bigger scale for those, you know, so it's a bit more hard wearing. Uh, any questions at this point? Um, so we got uh, some questions from the chat box and some comments. Comments from Sayuli. Uh, we were having this discussion. She's saying uh, in her hometown, that will be Brazil. Uh, but here, they have traditionally, uh, is that needle lace you have? No, that's bobbin lace. That she, okay. well, she was showing me, she was showing some fantastic colored uh, bobbin lace just before we started, which is really interesting. And also cut work, uh, that's often, uh, often they cut holes in um, cloths and then they decorate the holes with needle lace or sometimes bobbin lace even, insertions into, into I think that's a very, very popular thing. Many tablecloths all around the world like that. So uh, if we look for Sayuli, she's the one with glasses and then, uh, blue earphones on her background. That's the uh, Brazilian lace. What I find different is the color. Yeah. Most of the color you show, uh, and it's white, yeah. but Sayuli's background shows such a colorful uh, combination. Yeah, yeah. The, the only time you normally see colored lace is a couple of examples. In Honiton, they tried in the 19th century, there's about one or two examples in existence, something called chromatic lace. And if you go to the VNA website, you can look it up. Uh, it's colored lace, but it was never popular. And the other thing you always see it now is lace instructors, when they're teaching online, they use different colored threads so that you can follow the threads as you're practicing the lace. You can see that where the thread, the journey of the threads through the piece of lace. 
So you often see examples in colours by lace makers to, to demonstrate how to learn lace making. <laughs> but I'd never see normally coloured lace like that. It's fantastic. Yes. Yes. Jing Da raised a question, is imitation lace used for Muslim women? Do you know? Well, I've no, I, no idea. Um, imitation lace was basically a quicker, cheaper lace. So, uh, and it was a hobby lace as well. So people made it commercially and they made it as a hobby and they made it so that the middle classes who couldn't afford the very expensive lace could buy lace. That was basically it. And the same with machine lace. I'm actually writing my dissertation on this subject. So <laughs> come back next year. <laughs> we are very close to 2021. <laughs> uh, we'll see you again very soon. Uh, Maria asked a question. And have you heard of Le Lefkara lace? Yes, yes, Cyprus. Cyprus is, um, yes, all that area, all the Mediterranean, very, very keen on lace making. And it's spread further east now. And if you go on the internet, the internet is absolutely full of Russian and Eastern European people making lace uh, all through that, all east of Greece. But Greek lace is very, very famous, old lace. Um, and, and also lace like that becomes popular because it became a tourist um, attraction. People bought that as, um, as some, a souvenir of their holidays. So yes, yes, lace is made all over Europe, countries you wouldn't even think of. You know, even in the 18th century, 19th century, they were making it in Russia. You know, many, many types of lace around the world. And we got Jose from Panama. Uh, he said lace is used in their national dress. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Alera. And yeah. it's used to join the different parts of the national costume in Panama. Ah, that's interesting because I don't know about that at all about uh, Panama. I must look it up. But originally, there's a, there's a night dress. I think Minji saw it. I think you came. Did you come see? It? Did I show you the night dress in the V&A? But anyway, when they when they one of the first uses of lace was to join pieces of material together. So on shoulder seams and so on, on garments. And there's a night dress in the v &A and it's got that. It's got those sort of um, shoulder seams made out of it. So joining, joining pieces together is a very traditional use of lace. Yes. Um, so, and when, because both Jose and Sayuli are in our WhatsApp group. When you join, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sayuli and Jose, feel free to send videos and pictures. You can find. Yeah, yeah. interesting. So very interesting. Beneficial for any in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, should we move on a quick? If that's... Yes. Okay, so wealth and status. If you think of that, in the past, unfortunately, it was mainly men who had the highest status, unless you're Queen Elizabeth I. And <laughs> this is a picture that's in the V&A Museum, and it's a middle-class merchant family. So after the rich started wearing lace, gradually as the merchants became more uh, rich, they imitated their betters and wore lace. And this, this picture shows it beautifully because it's the family, the Holm family, 1628, they're from Yorkshire. And um, they're all wearing lace. And Henry, the husband, he's wearing the most expensive lace. So he's wearing Venetian needlepoint lace, which was the most fashionable at that time. And his wife, Dorothy, she's wearing pretty lace, but it's English lace, so it's cheaper lace. And the children who are not named, unfortunately, we don't know the children's names, um, are wearing miniature adult clothes, which is what the children did in those days. And they're wearing lace, but their lace is less fancy because, again, they've got lower status than their parents. So when you go around stately homes in the future, if you have the chance, look out for the lace and see if the men are wearing the best lace. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you move on. <laughs> I always like that. It's such a good example. Okay. Um, we haven't really got a lot of time to talk about the origins of lace, but I just want to point out, here's old Henry VIII on the left, and he's wearing his undershirt, the white shirt he's wearing, is really his underwear. It's fashionable to show it in those periods. <laughs> and at the top, because he was the king, everything had to be decorated, so they'd decorate his undershirt. But the point about an undershirt is it's normally linen, and you were boiled it because you didn't wash your outer clothing, you only washed your underwear. And, of course, it made it difficult to launder it if it was attached. So what they started doing was making separate collars. 
so that they could launder those more carefully separately. And they just decorated the collars. And that became collars and ruffs. And what they soon discovered is once they made them, they could take them off and wear them with many different costumes. So it had a lot of versatility to it. So it retained its value. Unlike a dress, once you've embroidered a material, you have to take the whole dress apart to reuse it. With collars, you could just use them day to day on different costumes. So that's why ruffs became popular. And you can see some of the ridiculous ruffs <laughs> that became popular uh, and so on uh, during this period. Absolutely yes, ridiculous. Having dinner with these collars. Yes, in fact, there were jokes about things like that. There's, there's many cartoons and things over the, the period about that. And in fact, they said that um, if you look at the woman in the top right, these huge, they used to call them, um, well, they had various names for them, but they said it looked like the head of John the Baptist on a platter. <laughs> you look like you'd have had your head shot off. Where, you know, it was to emphasise your head, but it just looked ridiculous. They used to call it um, all sorts of different funny names, uh, cartwheel ruffs and so on. But yeah, a lot of different uh, things. And it wasn't like it was a thing that you just wore, and it was set in that shape. It was actually a long piece of material that had to be reset every time it was worn. So don't think of getting a rough unless you've got servants. That's my advice. <laughs> Good tip. Good tip. <laughs> yeah. um, just a quick picture of some of the early laces. The early laces were often geometric in style because they came from embroidery. If you think of um, those cut works and drawn thread, you're following the warp and weft of the material. So they were geometric. And if you look at the bottom right hand picture, that's actually from an early pattern book. So they started making pattern books, sort of instruction books for designs. In the 1500s, 1600s, there were many, many pattern books in this period. And the VA have got quite a few of them. And these are just some of the laces that were made from these sort of patterns, these um, we end up called Van Dyck um, points. Beautiful, beautiful laces. Uh, if you move on. Uh, and this is just some pictures of some of the types of different uh, collars that would be worn, often uh, 1600, 1500s, 1600s. Uh, you can see they didn't just wear, like for 100 years they wore ruffs, then the next 100 years they wore something else. You can find pictures of, say, Queen Elizabeth wearing a whole variety of different uh, collars. Um, Yes, pearls, and lace, very good. Um, in fact, Horace Walpole, he said the Elizabethan time, it was like a giant farthingale, which was the, like the crinoline that they wore, um, a lot of lace and a bushel of pearls, he said. So <laughs> that was very much the fashion, pearls and lace. Um, they had to have these stand-up collars, they had to have starch. And starch didn't come to England until the uh, 1500s, in time of Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, often it was wheat or corn starch. And when it came, it meant that they could have these big collars that, start, that were starched. And in fact, a Dutch lady set up a shop in uh, London, I think it was Pall Mall, um, in 1560 something. And her name was uh, Dingham Vandenplas. Sorry for my pronunciation. And so it was like a dry cleaners. You'd take your start, your rough in there or your collar and she would start it for you professionally. And if you look at the bottom right hand uh, picture, uh, it's not very clear, but it's a metal frame that you would have, like a wire frame to hold up these standing collars, as they were called. Uh, I put the little um, uh, pair of glo or glove in there. And that's um, what uh, Dave, was, was it David asked the question about the gold lace? Who was it? I've forgotten, sorry. Uh, the gold lace, because the uh, gloves often had silver or gold lace on them, and that glove has uh, gold lace. They called it, these little laces, they called them bilament laces. If you think of um, Henry VIII's wives with those caps they wore, they were often trimmed with bilament laces. Wow. Yeah, beautiful, aren't they? Of course, that famous picture of Elizabeth I there, the orange picture, is amazing. That's the um, rainbow portrait at Hatfield House. Amazing. Okay, next one. Yes. Uh, of course, men wore as much lace. Men wore more lace, in fact, at some periods than women. Um, and just a few pictures here just to show you some of the different fashions of lace and different periods. They had 
the standing collars and then they had what they called the falling collars which came down and then when you had your long hair like our chap I think that's Louis XIV the young portrait um once you were wearing your hair long you didn't really want to waste money on lace behind your hair so they then started wearing these jabot sort of collars um for uh that and then eventually like the guy on the right who's also a portrait in the vna uh they wore these yes these more casual in fact that's called steinkirk that and then you've got all these mr darcy sort of uh stocks and different type of collars that they then uh wore more practically so lots of different fashions in men's lace as well okay if you go to the next one I had to show you this because they were just beautiful portraits, beautiful Rembrandt portrait of the chap, nicely demonstrating the sort of lace that men wore. Uh, in fact, it gets very frustrating for somebody who enjoys lace because as you go into the 18th century, the portraits are much more casual and the lace tends to be a couple of sort of wisps of white paint rather than detail, whereas this period they paint the lace beautifully. Um, he's wearing the beautiful collar there. Uh, I think he's got some silver lace around his sort of belt. Often you'd have cuffs with lace. And he's wearing these flounces of lace at the knee, at the bottom of his breeches. Uh, that was very, very common. And on his feet, you have shoe roses made of lace. Often these would be metallic laces. And you just, like you're making a paper flower, you wind it round and round, and then you just wear it on your shoes. Shoe roses, they were called. Um, <laughs> And the boots, I had to include the boots. They were, there was a fashion around about the 1630s for these bucket top boots, as they called them. And they would have lace sticking out the tops of them as well. And they would wear this, all this lace, even when they went into battle. And in fact, there was a joke at the time that men wouldn't, go, wouldn't be seen dead without their lace. And that literally would be what would happen. They would die in battle wearing their lace. And people would go and scavenge the lace off the battlefield <laughs> and wash the blood and mud out of it and resell it. <laughs> what a way to make money out of that people. Well, of course, there was worse because there was Waterloo teeth where they took the teeth out of the bodies and resold them to be made into false teeth. They were called Waterloo teeth. That was very famous in the period. But anyway, yes, moving on. <laughs> Look okay. At yeah, statues and you see lace in portraits, but you also see it in sculpture, statuary, all sorts of um, things. Uh, I wanted to show you a couple of examples. This guy bottom right is Thomas Baker. And he was actually, if you look at the Van Dyck portrait in the middle of Charles I, this was a portrait painted by Van Dyck. And in fact, he painted so many of the aristocracy wearing these sort of collars that they started calling these collars with the pointed edges, Van Dyck collars after him because uh, how many he painted, hundreds of them. Um, but this portrait was painted to send to Italy so that the sculptor Bernini could make a, a bust of Charles I as a present to Charles's wife. Um, but Baker was the guy who was entrusted with taking this portrait to Italy. And when he got there, he had such a good time. He stayed there for ages and they were writing him letters saying, when are you coming back with this sculptor? So he brought the bust back with him and unfortunately, Charles's uh, bust by Bernini was destroyed when the Palace of Westminster burnt down in 1690s. But Thomas Baker had his own uh, bust made at the same time, and his survives, which is the one in the picture. So that's the fate of the irony of history. But mm. if you look, if you get a chance to see it any time, it's beautiful. You can see it on the VNA website close up, and it's got beautiful carved lace on it. And the top left hand is a wooden cravat. So our famous, and that's at the v &A if you ever get to go there, um, that's um, our famous woodcarver was Gwynlyn Gibbons, our most famous uh, accomplished woodcarver. And he was fascinated with lace, this Venetian three-dimensional lace, needle lace. And he made carved this out of wood. And Horace Walpole owned it. And he had a dinner party. This is about 100 years after it was made. And he greeted his guests at the, wall, at the door wearing this wooden cravat. <laughs> That's a joke. A very strange man. Anyway. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> the babies. Yes, very grumpy looking baby. You think they'd have given it a smile. Um, 
Yeah, children, as I've said before, wore lace. And the picture on the right is Charles I's children wearing lace. Uh, the, the boy is the heir to the throne, so he's got better lace than the girls. The dogs don't have any lace. They obviously haven't got much status. <laughs> um, and uh, birth, marriages and death, people wore for lace for special occasions. And many people were buried wearing their best lace. Uh, and uh, the little swaddling sets and, and baby sets, all for, you know, christenings and so on. Okay, any questions at this point? Um, so we got comments. Um, yeah, the baby looks ill, I've just seen it. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't look, the baby, I agree, the baby doesn't look well. <laughs> that baby looks as though, almost as though it's died to me. Well, the Victorians are the ones who did a lot of that post-mortem yeah. portraits, but no, I think, I think it's, I, I imagine, I don't know, but the lace is looking very great. I think not an attractive baby anyway. <laughs> I think I think that the lace <laughs> is looking grey and I think the whole portrait's just got very grey with age. That would be my guess. Right, OK. <laughs> <laughs> the, the head of the baby is also disproportionately big. <laughs> Oh, oh, Minji, I could show you some very funny photos, uh, very funny pictures of babies where they just didn't know how to. There's wonderful one in the BNA I'll show you sometime where the baby is just like a tiny miniature adult. <laughs> it's about the size of a sort of orange, you know. <laughs> the dogs look quite sad. Yes, they are. They probably had to pose for ages. <laughs> uh, can you use lace for movies? Oh my goodness, I could talk a whole hour about that. I used to sell to uh, film companies, so I've got quite a lot of background in that. But I spend my whole time watching movies, seeing the wrong lace. <laughs> oh, because they were in front of the wrong period? Yeah, often completely wrong, sometimes just made up, sometimes, you know, some of it's accurate. Versailles, the, the Versailles TV series. <laughs> Some of it was really good and they were never quite, but some of it just looked like they'd taken tray cloths and stuck, stuck a hole in the middle of them for the head to come through. <laughs> and in the middle of the Versailles, if any of you watch Versailles, the young chap who starred in it, he was in a play in London, a very small play near me, in the middle, I think when they're filming it finished, it's a two-hander and I went to the small theatre and saw him and I really had to stop myself at the end, not going up to him and saying, what about your lace collars? <laughs> There should be a, a job for all the movies and TV shows to have a cheap lace designer. Yeah, she should have a lace designer. And in fact, a friend of mine, I saw, she, she, she did some wonderful, she gave some wonderful lace to one production I saw. So you do get good lace in some, some of them, you know. Uh, yeah, lace making machines, Mike, yes. That's the whole history of the 19th century. Um, there's books and books on the subject. Uh, it took a long time for it to um, get good. But by the end of the 19th century, you couldn't tell one from the other. When you could, in fact, I've got two pieces of lace here. I can't do it today because I couldn't show you in detail. But when I do my in-person one, I have a piece of Russell's lace and a piece of machine lace. And I ask people to guess which is which. And I would say 90% of the time, people get it wrong. I don't know if you can see the lace. Can you, can you see I'm holding mm -hmm. it up? One of those is handmade and one of those is machine lace. And at, for, at, a, at a distance, if we were in a, a ball or you know, wearing it in public, you couldn't go up with a microscope and go through the lace to see if it was handmade. So yeah, um, you know, uh, that's what destroyed lace because if everybody could wear machine copies that people couldn't tell the machine, there's no status to it anymore. That's basically what, what destroyed it. Mm. Um, is that a question? Oh, Mecklen lace. Oh, yeah. Well, everybody um, tells you that their lace was the best. Alonson lace, they call themselves the queen of lace. If you go to Brussels and buy lace books like I did and come back and read them, <laughs> you'll just laugh for a week because it's, I mean, Brussels lace was the finest lace. I'm not querying that. But according to the books I bought in Brussels, there's never, ever been another lace in existence. <laughs> I've got a beautiful piece of Mechelen lace here, and I have to say Mechelen is my favourite lace, I would guess, uh, 18th century. This is a piece of 18th century Mechelen lace. It's, I normally take it when I do my in-person ones so that people can hold it, and it's like tissue paper. You literally, it's the weight of tissue paper, 
and it would take hundreds of hours to make that. It was a superb lace, superb lace. Mm -hmm. In a wealthy family, under whose domain, father's mother did the choice of lace pattern, lace maker for when it came to choose lace for the children and others in the household. Um, I don't know. Um, you would, you would just have the best for yourself, wouldn't you? You wouldn't let the kids run around with <laughs> good <laughs> lace. <laughs> you had any sense? No, I, I don't know. I, um, you wouldn't. Yeah, you would. You would almost sub. Con I mean, it's a good question. I've not thought about it, but subconsciously you would choose the best lace for the people with the most status wouldn't you and often even in, in portraits you didn't even own the actual lace in the portraits you know a portrait that you just tell the lace maker to paint really good lace on you <laughs> yes uh, what tracy says yes that is the point the portability of lace the question about um, wore it on different dresses that was the thing it was normally just like i'm wearing a piece of a lace collar today you mm. know you, you just this is my collection um, you wore it for many different occasions and you know another subject they reworked it they they changed the style of it for different centuries it, you know yeah it was a um, an heirloom in the family mm. yeah. really good questions right. uh, well a couple more coming one more coming wills and inventories another thing I could talk about for an hour <laughs> I've got some great <laughs> quote I've got some great quotes about this <laughs> I mean, there was a famous actress. They wrote a poem about her because she, um, she, when she died, she, um, uh, <laughs> she, she was buried in her best lace. And they wrote, Alexander Pope wrote a poem about it because she, you know, she said, "I wouldn't sit." I mean, it was I, without. I can't quote the poem without looking at it, but it's something like, um, "Give my cheek a little blush and then put my best lace on." Something like that. <laughs> Yes, very, very often mentioned in wills and inventories. Yes, very much. Wow. Uh, and in fact, um, oh no, that was a piece of um, text, a different piece of text I was thinking about. Martha, Was Martha Washington left some of the Spitalfield silk in her will. Anyway, that's something else I was thinking about. Okay, let's go on to the next thing. We'll have a. Okay, so by the 18th century, uh, the taste in lace changed. That's Queen Mary on the left with her very fancy lace at the end of the 1690s. And then lace became Mechelen. This is what we were talking about. This very beautiful, fine lace, this very flat lace became much more fashionable. Bobbin lace. So instead of needle lace, it became bobbin lace. The collar on the right is absolutely exquisite. And you, you look at it, it almost looks like just a material collar. The top bit obviously is material, but the lace is almost like material. So you're doing this huge amount of um, work just to make it look very plain. But those, those are the fashions of the day. Uh, delicate. Okay. Oh, amazingly delicate, amazingly delicate. Uh, yeah, and if we think about lace making, we normally think of lace as being sort of a woman in a cottage, but it wasn't always. That's another thing that's really interesting about lace. Over its sort of four or 500 year period of history, um, it took many different forms. Um, so this is Jean-Baptiste Colbert, who was at the time of Versailles, um, a Louis XIV uh, finance minister. And because the court was very ornate and wore very, very expensive foreign laces, it was unbalancing the economy of France. This was how important lace was, that it, was, it would unbalance the economy uh, because so much money was pouring out to foreign lace, to buy foreign lace. So he um, decided that only uh, French lace should be worn and to do that he had to invent French lace because it didn't really exist before that so he set up a lace making industry sort of a national lace making industry um, at Alençon and other places and he brought in foreign lace makers uh, from Italy and from Flanders from Belgium that area uh, and they were threatened with death by the Italians didn't want them to steal the secrets so they threatened these lace makers with death but obviously they did go and that's where the French lace making industry started. It was a state sponsored venture. Um, if you go to the next slide, thank you. Um, but this is what we more or less think about lace making woman sitting outside a cottage. That was true in many places, but also it was very organized. The bottom right is Belgium, very organized lace industry using very good designers. And so they had really good lace schools. 
top right is England. Even in the early 20th century in lace making areas, lace making was still taught as part of the school curriculum. I mean, that's quite a modern, relatively modern looking picture, probably 1920s. Um, and then you've got the women at the top. This postcard amuses me because they're making bobbin lace, but the dress that's beside them looks like Irish crochet to me. But I might be completely wrong, but <laughs> just very strange. Uh, of course, you've got the Brussels lace shop below. You can still go and buy lace. Don't say I told you, but a lot of the lace sold in Brussels now doesn't come from Brussels. <laughs> but anyway, um, <laughs> the old stuff does. Uh, and bottom left is interesting, wartime laces. The Belgians were really, First World War, the Belgians were really, um, well, a lot of Belgium was just destroyed by the First World War. And the Americans particularly sponsored um, the lace makers to keep the skills going. And they would send um, a linen, they pay for linen threads and get linen threads into Belgium so the lace makers continue. And then they would sell these pieces of lace to often wealthy Americans um, to, to keep them going, really, financially. Um, and um, I've got a couple of pieces of wartime lace somewhere in my collection. OK, next one, please. This is Minji's favourite bit. We're running over a little bit, but anyway. Uh, smuggling, shoplifting and sumptuary laws. <sighs> shoplifting throughout lace history, shoplifting. That's an 18th century picture. The guy who's finding the lace under her dress is having far too much fun, I think. He's feeling her leg by the things. So a lot of shoplifting went on. And smuggling. So smuggling is famous thing, you know, um, you know, tobacco, brandy, lace was always smuggled. Um, the picture on the right is a lady who's uh, the woman on the right in the black is a, a customs official, a female customs official in the 19th century. I think this is smuggling into America, this particular one, funny enough. And she, the woman's got lace wrapped around her petticoat that she's smuggled to avoid customs duties. Uh, and um, some tree laws, like we said before with Louis XIV, they banned foreign lace to preserve their um, economy. And in England, we often ban foreign lace a few times. And the lady in blue is uh, Princess Augusta, and she was George III's sister. And when she was getting married, at that time, you weren't supposed to wear foreign lace. And the customs official went to the court milliners, who was making all the lace for the costumes, and raided it just before the wedding and, and took all the lace <laughs> that they were going to use in the wedding to show the point that you shouldn't wear foreign lace. So the poor woman couldn't have foreign lace in her. Wedding. And the awful thing is, when they did this, they used to burn the lace, burn the lace, hundreds. There was a lace shop also at the time who was raid, that raided, and they took 100 pounds, that's 45 kilograms weight of lace, and um, burnt it. Really, really sad. But there you go. Why I mean, just... Patriotism, where your own country is laced. Yes, yes. Well, the following year they did, you see, after this, they made the point, you know. Uh, if you go to the next one, I found this, this next slide just recently. I just love it. It's, it's a customs officers talking about how people were concealing lace. It's like drug smuggling. It's just like drug smuggling. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. Well, there you go. So... So that is, is it to teach people how to smuggle lace? Or no, it's, it's, imagine it's, I don't know, but I imagine this was a book for other customs officials telling them what to look out for. And it goes through bit by bit showing them where all this lace was concealed. <laughs> okay, if you go to the next one, amazing, isn't it? Um, okay, so. During the long history, lace went in and out of fashion. If you think of Jane Austen's Times Empire and Regency costume, very little lace. There was some lace on it, but very little. Um, the two pictures in the middle is it's not lace. It's the first one. The top one is embroidery on muslin, what they often call Dresden work. Uh, that was very popular in this period. And the bottom one is the machine nets came in around about the early 1800s, but they were plain. They couldn't pattern the machine lace to start with. It's just plain net. So you'd embroider it by hand. So embroidered nets were very popular. By the 1820s and 30s, which is the picture on the right, they got fed up with these very plain styles. And it all started coming back with lots of lace trim. 
Uh, okay, this one. Uh, just to show you quickly, Victorian lace, uh, the fashions of the period. Uh, you had the huge black Chantilly lace shawls, parasols covered with this sort of lace. Lace fans were very popular in Victorian times. The big collar at the bottom is what they call a bertha. Uh, these very wide collars, very popular. Uh, the lady in yellow and blue, a black, that's um, flounces of lace on the costume. What was interesting is they'd say the same design and make it in two or three different scales. So the bottom flounce would be the same pattern as the middle one, but a bigger scale. So that was really technically difficult. And the little um, bag and then the woman and the two on the right, those are Irish crochet that became very popular during this period, one of the imitation laces. Okay, next one, please. Uh, Edwardian, end of the 19th century, early 20th century. Lace again was hugely fashionable. We think all those white, floaty white summer dresses covered in lace, like the Life magazine one on the left. She looks beautiful in all her lace. Uh, the one on the right is ladies going to Ascot races. I love that one. All the, it's like her hat with all this weird, the black hat with all the weird lace panels on its face. And the middle one is 1918 and it's the um, the flu pandemic. <laughs> I thought I had to put this year. I almost thought it's this year. I had to put it in when I found out. I mean she's wearing a lace top, you know, and lace on her outfit, but but there you go. <laughs> At least it's not a lace face mask. <laughs> I had to put that in when I found it. But that was the 1918 flu pandemic. Uh, but, uh, one more please. Uh, 20th century, of course, uh, still used a lot of machine lace, mainly machine lace. Um, uh, 1960s one, Kate Moss on the right, and the 90s, 20s lady with her, looks like she's got her neck curtains out <laughs> in the middle. Uh, one more, please. Uh, royal patronage was always very, very popular for lace. Um, they often sent free things to the royals, you know, handkerchiefs and things to promote their lace industries, or they would buy uh, lace. Uh, you've got Kate uh, uh, Middleton uh, wearing a lace dress there, Duchess of Cambridge, um, and the, our Queen in the 1950s going to the races in a nice machine lace thing. And then in the middle, you've got Queen Victoria, who promoted English lace very uh, well, and she's wearing her wedding lace there. She was married in 1840 and she had English Honiton lace makers make her dress. And then she wore that lace throughout her life. So she was very keen on promoting it. <laughs> Tracy, I could tell you a whole story about that lace. Really, I could. <laughs> Don't believe everything you hear. That's all I'm saying. I bet you could. <laughs> I could tell you a whole story about that. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so weddings, I just wanted to say, this is the last slide, but weddings, basically, of course, nowadays you use lace lingerie, but weddings, and you've got some beautiful uh, wedding lace. Uh, Princess Grace had the most beautiful Brussels lace. And then you've got Kate with her beautiful, beautiful wedding dress covered in lace, bringing lace back into fashion. But if you look at uh, previous generations, some use lace, some didn't use lace. Quite often the lace would be, if you have a lace veil in the family, I went and saw a lady only recently to uh, appraise her lace and she had two, uh, three beautiful different lace stalls that all come, stalls, wedding veils that all come down her family. Yeah, so uh, that's the final slide. So any questions, please? Any questions, feel free to comment. Yes. Uh, oh, yes, I'd like to see Kate uh, Grace Kelly's wedding dress. I'm just going to stop sharing the slides so we can yeah. all see everybody. Uh, we, this is an, uh, another fantastic session. <laughs> uh, and you. Can, can I talk? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah Wilma, please. <laughs> Has, uh, has the lady that was uh, presenting the uh, storytelling today, has she heard the song, uh, the rock and roll song, Chantilly Lace? I have indeed, I have indeed. <laughs> oh. 
Uh, I mean, great. funny enough, funny enough, yeah. it's very relevant because that's why yeah. Chantilly lace is so well known. When I when I talk to people, you know, who, who don't know what I do, and they say, well, "What do you do?" and I say, well, "I sell lace," and they always go in England, they go, "Oh, Nottingham lace," which is which isn't a proper lace, it's machine lace, or they go, "Oh, Chantilly lace." Yeah, and that's exactly why because they've heard of the song. <laughs> Well, you you guys must have uh, started at eight o'clock uh, Eastern time, oh. and uh, I didn't realize that, so I just I I tuned in at nine o'clock here oh. Eastern Standard Time. Oh dear, yeah, well, because a it's a uh, daytime. I think daylight saving. Yeah, we went off daylight saving time last week, I, I believe, yeah. Uh, Wilma, it's good to know today because you are going to host your session very soon. We don't want right. to. Yes. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good thing, yeah. So, and, uh, Rachel asked a question. How popular would you say lace collecting is for today? Yeah, lace making is very popular. It's really, really popular. If you go on the internet, like I said earlier, amazing the amount of lace that's been made all over Russia, Eastern Europe, all those countries. I mean, they've got a heritage in lace making, but it's really, really popular um, hobby. And you get lace makers all over the world. I get, when I do my talks in London, I get people all over the world who are lace makers or one of the imitation laces. So it's very, very popular. Some people do collect lace. Uh, people often use it in crafts. But I went to Japan, and I mean, it's a long story, I can't tell you about this woman I met, but there was somebody I met in Japan, really by chance, who knew me from London, and she took me to her home and showed me her lace collection, and I was breathless. It was the best lace collection, private lace collection I've ever seen in my life, and that's in Japan, just in somebody's house. <laughs> wow. You know, and so you never know, there's people, lace collectors all over the world. Yes, and... Uh... Uh, I think one one thing I love about uh, meeting people like you is with this very apparently simple piece of lace. Yeah, I yeah. bet, and you can talk for a year and then stop yeah. about history, economy, yeah. stuff, uh, international relationships, and world politics behind it. Yeah. I mean, I was really hurrying today because I made so many slides. <laughs> I wanted you to see the pictures, but I could have talked much more slowly and, you know, more in detail about all of those different areas. There's so much, so much in the history of lace. And people don't realise, people think, oh, lace tablecloth, crochet doily. They don't understand how important lace was. I mean, yeah. Valon the city of Valenciennes is French because of lace. It was a Belgian town and when they had wars they always wanted to take the French the French always wanted to take the town because it meant that they'd get the revenue from lace making so important so this place is you know they fought wars over lace in effect so and we always have next week next month and next year <laughs> yes <laughs> talking about uh, next week I want to introduce our host for next week uh, in our group we actually uh, coincidentally got several professors and uh, Maximino is a professor of philosophy and theology from Brazil. Uh, Max, do you want to say hello to us? Hello, guys, in the philosophical way. Yes. So next week is 22nd of November. It's a quite special date because uh, it was precisely 20 years ago, Max took up the hobby of drumming. <laughs> so for <laughs> the uh, drum set, uh, he went to church uh, for some spiritual reasons. He started drumming, but he didn't hire any teacher at all. He learned the whole music, uh, how to play it through reading uh, encyclopedia, history of music. That's how he began to learn all by himself. Uh, so same time next week, we have this amazing um, Maximino professor of theology and philosophy to uh, show us the history of drum sets. And he's going to play the drum live with us as well. 
So we so much look forward to it. Uh, thank you again, and for another fantastic session about lace. We want to see you back. And we <laughs> thank you very much. Also, uh, warmly welcome Max Mino to show us uh, cultural history and your homemade, uh, your DIY drum set, same time next week. So guys, see you next week. Bye. 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 Yeah, we'll make Yeah, please. I'm still here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I missed the last couple of weeks. So I'm sorry, but I was out doing stuff. No problem at all. We actually recorded all these sessions. Um, I, do you actually, among us and our friends network, do we know people with editing skills? Uh, to edit these videos so I can upload them on YouTube later on. <laughs> so right. if you know anyone who uh, have skill set with editing, uh -huh. okay, uh, yeah, to connect with me. Uh, so that's something because we got more and more people uh, emailing me saying, um, unfortunately, it's too early or they've got something else going on. They can't join the live session. So right. we trying to make the recordings uh, user friendly for for so so are you on facebook yes why don't you uh friend me on uh facebook yes and uh you can see some of the stuff uh that i've been doing oh what what have which kind of project has kept you busy engaged? <laughs> well last sunday i flew a jet fighter airplane <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's just something you do for Monday. Uh, 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 and the and the Sunday before that, I drove a race car. <laughs> so, actually, Wilma, I'm still reading the book you wrote. Uh, right. Yeah, uh, Sharecropper's Son. Yeah. You, you, so, did I remember you? Did you pick up uh, piloting and sailing from? Yeah. Wilma? Your military life. Yeah, I learned. I learned to sail. Uh, I first learned uh, to sail small boats here in Florida, and then I learned to sail the bigger boats uh, when I was on sabbatical at the uh, in Sydney, Australia. Yes. So, and and I learned to fly. I'd, I'd always wanted to fly. So when I was working at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, I went through an FAA flight school and got my pilot's license. So you seem so. to have done so much uh, with so many hobbies. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's just fascinating to read about them. So how far have you gotten in the book? I, um, I finished the chapter when you did the service in Philippines. Oh, and okay. Right. No, college life. I think that's I, so. This is, I think I, I'm at the chapter where you listen to a presentation and you decided to choose mathematics or physics because. Yeah, of right, right. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Yes. All right. Are you enjoying it? Yes. It's, I, it's amazing how much energy you have. And right. <laughs> many, so, may I ask you a question, Wilma? Sure. Um, you seem to have done so much and excel at so many things. Right. From a background, you are the youngest of 10 siblings and right. you didn't have a pair of shoes when right. you were kids. May I ask, what's the philosophy of your life that led you to so much and achieve so much? I, I I really I really don't know. It's uh, you know it 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 was kind of amazing, but uh, because I've never really uh, had had a plan or a blueprint to to follow. Uh, I just did whatever I wanted to when I wanted to and when I could, and that there are so many things that. Uh, that I wanted to do, especially exciting things. I, 
I suppose I'm a thrill seeker <laughs> because I went uh, skydiving also since I've spoken with you the last time. So I'm just fortunate to, uh, you know, how to, to be in uh, uh, good enough health to uh, continue to do things like that, that, uh, that I've always wanted to do. And I, I made a, I made a bucket list not long ago. <laughs> so, so now that I'm semi-retired, I'm, uh, I'm doing things, uh, you know, that I have on my bucket list and, and I try to, uh, to check them off, uh, you know, as, as quickly as I can, because I realize I don't have many years left on earth. So, uh, so how I'm old are you? How old are you now? 86. So, uh, so I, so I hope, uh, I might live a few more years. So I have a brother, my oldest brother is 95. And uh, there's another one in between who's 78. So there are three of us still living out of the 10. So last week when I did rehearsal with Maximino, Maximino uh -huh. I always remember the thing about Brazilian culture you told me about the uh, being spontaneous. So Max told me uh, part of the Brazilian culture is uh, being spontaneous. And he recommended me a book uh, yeah. of the drunk head. Yeah. <laughs> in my book, uh, it's in my office now. Uh, oh, yeah. Which basically says, if you want to explain, Max, I think you would uh, say yeah. it. I'll get a book. Okay. I, I was so, talking with Minji uh, about this point. Uh, no, Brazilians, uh, it's common for us not to do a plan. Uh, for anything. Of, of course, a lot of things we have to plan, but in general, our life, uh, lives, uh, we, we live without plans. We are uh, easy, passionate for everything, and it makes uh, our culture or way of life like, uh, you, like you say, you live. So, so where, where, where are you from? Where, where do you live? I am from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I must be Brazilian then, because I, <laughs> I never, I, I, I don't plan many things. I mean, uh, long term. Yes, and uh, this is the book Max recommended. Is it this book? Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> so. It's very much like what you said. Uh, so send me the name of that. I'd like to get a copy of it. I will. Okay. Basically, it says when we were born or when we wake up every morning. Right, yeah. No idea what's going to happen. Right. <laughs> so uh, the best is to live every moment and every, do the best that we can. Yeah, well, Gary, Gary knows me pretty well. He probably knows me about as well as anybody uh, here in uh, in Florida, because he and I uh, have been friends for quite some time, and uh, we went on a couple of motorcycle adventures together. <laughs> and that's in the book. You'll you'll read about that. We also came to UK together, to Cambridge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the first time that I saw Wilmer was at a homeowners uh, association meeting. He stood up and I thought, who is this guy? <laughs> well, uh, from one of my friends who I rode motorcycles with, uh, when he first met me, he thought I was probably a truck driver. But you were very low profile. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I'm looking forward to uh, to next Sunday. As far as I know, I'll be uh, I'll be around uh, because I was exposed to COVID a week ago, and uh, several I think 
uh, five of my friends uh, tested positive, and uh, I was sitting next to one of them. So I had a, I got, I was tested yesterday, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't know the uh, results yet. But I'd been tested before, and it, it was negative. So. I assume it'll be negative this time. I don't know. It might not be. Uh, I may be one of those people who don't have any symptoms, but still test positive. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so I feel you know I, I I have no symptoms whatsoever. Yeah, you uh, you so basically you try to protect other people by isolating yourself. Yeah, that's why I've uh, I've. I'm on, on self quarantine right now, so I hadn't been, uh, haven't been out of the house since I found out that I was exposed to the virus. Mm. Well, uh, as of luck, and enjoy your holiday staying at yeah. <laughs> hard. Not uh, who, who knows? Maybe I'll write another book. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. We come next week. Um, I had a one hour chat with Max Mingo. He is a simply an incredible person. Um, oh yeah, well, I'm looking forward to that. I, that should really, really be a lot of fun. Yes. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, so wonderful. And I hope to yeah. arrange another one with you next yeah, year. Yeah, we'll do another one next year. Yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. Okay. Great, guys, see you Bye. 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 Thank you, Anne. Amazing Bye. presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.